Interessant. Okay, so we are here to discuss happiness. And happiness is a word. So it's very good to look at the etymology of happiness. Where did this word come from? Happiness is an English word. And it comes from uh, much earlier, much older words, which signified luck, chance, luck. Um, so if you, if you were happy 400, 500, 600 years ago, it meant that you were lucky. And another meaning of happy, about six, 700 years ago, it uh, was equal. So luck, equality, prosperity, having a lot of money, a lot of property. These were the meanings of the word happy a few hundred years ago. And the Scottish also, also used the word happy to describe someone blessed by God, chosen by God. The Puritan Protestants, when they established the United States of America, uh, the colonies that became the United States of America, the Protestants believed that when you are chosen by God, when you are blessed by God, you become a rich man. Rich people are blessed by God. And the Scots used the word happy to describe such people. So as you see, the original meaning of the word happy had a lot to do with money. Having money, having property, being rich. <laughs> this is what people then considered happy. The only exception were the Welsh, people from Wales. People from Wales use the word happy to describe someone who is wise. And I much prefer, I much prefer this interpretation of the word happy because I think happiness requires wisdom. If you're not a wise person, you are very, very unlikely to be happy. I th there are three components, three ingredients in happiness, and all of them require some wisdom. The first component is that you have managed your life or you manage your life well. You are self-efficacious. In other words, you are able to obtain outcomes and results which are good for you, beneficial for you, and for those you love. And you are self-actualized. You have realized your potential. So the first element in happiness is that is good management of life, good management or realization of potential, making yourself and everyone around you accomplish goals which make them happy in a way. The second component is that you contribute to something outside yourself. If you're focused only on yourself, if you are, if there is only the first ingredient that you're managing your life well, and that's not enough. You need to be connected to something bigger than you, something outside yourself. This something outside yourself could be imaginary. For example, God. God is an imaginary being, so you could be connected to God. It could be real. It could be a nation. It could be a community. It could be a football club. It could be a volunteer, volunteer organization. As long as you're connected to something outside you, bigger than you, you contribute to the collective, you contribute to the community, you have a sense of belonging, a sense that you're making a difference, you're a change agent, that is a condition for happiness. And the third condition, I think, the third component, is that you have conducted yourself in life with dignity and with integrity. You had values, you observed these values, you never deviated, you never betrayed yourself, you never betrayed your beliefs, and your convictions and your values. So dignity and integrity are crucial to happiness. I see, I think these are the three elements, having respected and loved yourself, conducted yourself with dignity and integrity, managed your life well, and contributed to your community. These are the components of happiness, I think. So happiness is not the same as gratification. Gratification is temporary. Happiness is much more prolonged. I would say that gratification is a state of mind, while happiness is a state of being. So you could acquire gratification, it changes your state of mind, but then you need more gratification. Gratification, in other words, is addictive. Happiness is not. It's a state of being. And happiness, therefore, is internal, not external. 
anything that comes from the outside and makes you happy, that's not happiness. That's gratification. So it's internal and not external. So grandiosity, um, hedonism, self-sufficiency, proud self-sufficiency. I don't need anyone. I don't care about anyone. Um, these are all forms of narcissism. And people very often confuse these things with happiness. People confuse possession, owning, owning things. I have a new car. I have a new smartphone. I have a new wife. <laughs> I have a new girlfriend. Owning things. People objectify. They convert into objects. Everything, including other people. They use other people. They Other people become commodities. And so anything that comes from the outside and is consumed is not happiness, it's gratification. And in our current civilization, capitalism taught us that consumption is happiness. Not even that it is conditioned for happiness, but that it, it is happiness. So if you don't consume, you're not happy. If you're not able to consume, you're not happy. Not possible to be happy without consumption. So, and of course, this is a lie propagated by capitalists because they want to increase their profits. They are addicted to growth, constant growth and so on and so forth. So they need people to consume. But if people realize that consumption makes them depressed, consumption makes them unhappy, consumption is an addiction, consumption is mentally ill. If people were to realize this, they would stop consuming or minimize consumption. And this would create a gigantic economic crisis and a fall in profits and bottom lines of companies, and they cannot afford it. Of course, media, the media, mass media, social media, these are capitalistic corporations. Even universities are capitalistic corporations. Most intellectuals are capitalists. They make money out of their public intellectual position. It's all about money, so you can trust no one. You can trust no one with your happiness. You should not look for a guide or a guru or mentor and so on and so forth because they are contaminated and corrupted by money. The only locus of happiness is inside you and you have all the information you need more or less from the moment you're born. All the information you need in order to be happy. You just need to learn how to read yourself and then how to respect what you, what you learn about yourself, how to respect yourself. Our civilization is a civil civilization of self-disrespect, self-trashing. And so when you don't respect yourself and you're an addict, you're a junkie of consumption, then of course you cannot be happy. Now, happiness is individual. I am happy in one way, you're happy in another way. This is why we can never define happiness, never. And we can never define love because I love one way, you love another way. That's why there's no definition of love that is accepted, not even in psychology. These are idiosyncratic, individual, individual uh, outcomes. So we cannot capture them in a lexical definition. Each person is happy in his own way but an unhappiness is universal. So we both are happy in different ways, but we are unhappy in the same way. Unhappiness is universal. So if we want to study happiness, we should not study the existence of happiness, but we should study the absence of happiness because it is the absence of happiness that is universal. The existence of happiness depends on you, on me, on her, and it's individual. We cannot study anything. I cannot learn anything from you about happiness. Nothing. We can talk nine hours now and I will still learn nothing from you about happiness. I can learn a lot about your happiness, but it has nothing to do with my happiness. However, if I learn what makes you unhappy, I can learn a lot about happiness because it is the absence of happiness that defines happiness is like negative, a negative becomes a beautiful photograph, you know? So I created a, a therapeutic tool, 
tool in therapy that I, I called it the map of happiness. And the map of happiness has two components. I ask when I when I teach you the map of happiness, I ask you, what is the thing without which you can never be happy? So I'm not asking you what makes you happy. That's not the question. I am asking you, what is the thing without which, if this thing is not in your life, you can never be happy? So, for example, wine. I like wine. Wine makes me happy. But I can definitely be happy without wine. So this is wrong. wrong question. What makes me happy is wrong question. But I can tell you that if I didn't have access to books, I would never be happy. So the question is, what in my life is something without which I can never be happy? And the answer is my case is books. Each person is, some person has, will answer sex, some person will answer food. So my, my answer is books. Many things make me happy. Very few things are preconditioned for my happiness. Very few things, without them, I can never be happy. But many, many things make me happy. So we should focus on the few things without which you cannot be happy. And the second question in my map of happiness, when I ask the people, yes, I'm asking, when you are not happy, how do you feel? How does the absence of happiness feel to you? And you will be surprised that people never think about this. They think how they want to be happy. They think how they want to be happy. They say, I want to have money. I want to travel a lot. I want to have a beautiful girl. I want to have a car. You know? But they don't sit around and say, okay, let me now uh, get acquainted. Let me get familiar with my condition of unhappiness. Let me think deep about the situation when I'm not happy. Very few people are doing this. They can say to you, I'm not happy right now, but they don't analyze it. They don't really study it. To understand happiness, you need to study the absence of happiness. Unhappiness is a much more extreme condition. Unhappiness is really distress, depression, anxiety. Unhappiness is an active state. I'm not talking about unhappiness. I'm talking about absence of happiness, happiness, what the existentialist called ennui. Absence of happiness, when life is dull, is not exciting, is not, not worth living. You can't get up out of bed, not because you're depressed, but because life has nothing much to offer you, like a very long and boring film, you know. So this is a condition of absence of happiness. We feel very good when we are happy, because that's an active state. And we feel very strong and actually we feel very good when we are unhappy. Because when we are challenged, when we have to overcome something, when we have to fight in order to accomplish things, we feel good. Happiness and unhappiness, these two active states, make you feel good, not bad. It is the absence of happiness, which is essentially the absence of life that makes you feel bad. Depression is not about anything objective. You can find multi-billionaires who are depressed. It's not about some, it's not about an objective thing. Depression is the hopelessness, is hopelessness. It's the belief that nothing good or exciting is ever going to happen to you again. So it's not unhappiness. If you if you have to work hard because you lost all your money and you have to work hard to make money, that is a challenge that that energizes you, gives you energy. So that's unhappiness, but it gives you energy. Happiness and unhappiness energize. Absence of happiness takes away your energy, depletes you, depresses you. And essentially, it's a form of death, absence of happiness. Only in death there is absence of happiness. That's in a nutshell, a few observations about happiness and related issues. <laughs> Somehow you, you've answered uh, uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> That's good. Uh, from my list. Um, uh, 
uh, in brief or uh, in detail. So I will jump to um, the question number three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, missed, I missed some questions. This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's great. Uh, I'm thinking what is a good uh, and healthy ratio between uh, happiness and unhappiness? I think most of our lives, we should be unhappy. I think the healthy state is for most of our lives, we should be unhappy. This happiness is a, uh, happiness leads to conservatism. When you're happy, you want to freeze. You want to freeze. You don't want to change anything. You don't want to transform anything. You don't want to experiment. You don't want to explore. You don't want to discover. You don't want to move because if you move, this happiness maybe is illusion, maybe it will disappear like smoke, and you don't want this. You freeze. We have another condition where we freeze. Trauma. In trauma, we freeze. When you're confronted with a traumatic state, the danger, extreme danger, you freeze. Happiness also represents an extreme danger. What is the danger? Losing the happiness. So when you are happy, there is a constant fear of loss, abandonment, anxiety, fear that you will lose the happiness. So it freezes you. You're afraid to do anything. I think the healthy condition is to be most of the time unhappy and to strive for happiness, to desire happiness, to act in order to obtain happiness, but most of the time to not be happy because this is the engine, this is the fuel that moves humanity. All humanity is, is working on this fuel. If you, you know, you know what is the ultimate condition, ultimate condition of depression? When all your dreams come true, when all your wishes are fulfilled. I cannot think of any more dangerous situation to the mind. I think so this would I would become suicidal. If all my wishes came true and all my dreams come true, I would become suicidal. So happiness is dangerous. It's a, it's a dangerous uh, drug. And in small doses, it's healing. Like every medicine, in small doses, it heals. But in too big, big doses, you're poisoned. So practically, uh, should the pursuit of happiness uh, be one of our daily uh, tasks or uh, I don't know should it be on our everyday to-do list yes I, I think it should be actually the only task if if happiness is defined the way I defined it you remember the three components the three ingredients then this should be our only task everything good everything good is about failing to accomplish the goal. Only when you fail to accomplish the goal, there is a good outcome. I will give you an example, science. Science is investigating. The idea is that science can find the truth, but science never succeeds to find the truth. Science always fails. There is a theory today, tomorrow, we discover that it's nonsense. And there is a new theory, and a new theory, and a new theory, and like that for hundreds of years. Science is not about success. Science is about failing, failure. And that's why it's a good thing. We should pursue happiness in order to fail in this pursuit. Happiness should remain a goal somewhere out there, and we should always aspire to it. Similar thing is good, for example, to be good. We cannot really be good, pe good people because we are human. None of us can be 100% good. We are sometimes evil, sometimes vicious, sometimes wicked, sometimes, you know, not nice, not kind. No, no one can be 100% good. But we should aspire to be good. We should aspire, those of us who are religious are not. But those of us who are religious should aspire to God. Is there any chance whatsoever that you will ever meet God, 
or you you because union with God. No, it's an aspiration. Everything is an aspiration. Everything good is an, a process of aspiration. It's a process, not an event. So the 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 good dynamic is to aspire to pursue happiness. Realizing that you will never attain it. But you can get closer and closer. Same like God, same like good, same like science, same like everything important in life. You just get closer and closer to it. Same like love. That's nice. I, w I was thinking, thinking about um, different uh, roles. So I was uh, getting to the... Uh, to genetics and i was asking myself uh, what role do genetics uh, play in determining uh, happiness or unhappiness and after that i was going to uh, clusters that are prone to happiness or to unhappiness and uh, i don't know mental uh, state health and uh, different uh, situations like this if you want to discuss a little bit uh... well there's no there's no scientific discussion of happiness happiness exactly like god or these are not scientific topics so in psychology we don't use good and evil no such thing and in psychology we do use the word happiness but it is so ill-defined that i have no idea what these people are talking about and i hope they do because i don't i read many articles about happiness and so on they all fail to define what it is that they're talking about. So I don't think this is a serious conversation. However, we do have in psychology or clinical psychology, we do distinguish people who are functional from people who are dysfunctional. Um, they are also known as mentally healthy and mentally ill or mentally disordered. And functioning is perceived as a proxy for happiness. The more functional you are, presumably, the more content or happy you are. That's a presumption. It's, it's an assumption. There are no serious studies that correlate functioning with happiness. However, there are many serious studies that correlate dysfunction with unhappiness. Again, the study of the absence of happiness is much more serious. So we know that people with mental health issues, mental health disorders, for example, personality disorders, we know they're not happy. We, th this we know with, with very high certainty. However, we don't know very much uh, what, what kind of people are happy. And we don't have any proof that functioning well leads to happiness. And in serious psychology, clinical psychology, not the nonsense online, but in clinical psychology, we don't discuss anything except functioning because we cannot measure anything else. We cannot capture anything else. We don't define anything else. We can define only functioning. So this is in a nutshell. Now, th this is psychology. In philosophy, the conversations are completely different in philosophy. So, as I said, there is the issue of agency, for example. Do you have agency? Do you have, do you assume control over your life? Are you authentic? That's existentialism. Are you authentic? Are you really you? Or are you just imitating other people? Or, and so on. So these are questions in philosophy that have to do with the human mind and the human psyche. They are philosophical, so they cannot be they cannot be subjected to scientific study. And yet they touch upon some crucial elements of happiness, I think. If you are not authentic, for example, I don't think you can ever be happy. If you're not really you, if you are imitating other people, if you're just fulfilling a social role, if you're acting, if you're pretending, if you're faking, I don't think you can be happy. Um, because you don't have a you. There's no self. If you are not, if you reject yourself, you cannot be happy. If you betray yourself, you cannot be happy. And by faking and pretending and acting, you're betraying yourself. So I think that's a condition. Another condition is that you have ownership of your life. You feel that you control them. You have an external locus of control. You believe that you are in charge of your life. You, you determine what is happening to you at any given moment, and where you are going, and so on and so forth. The third element, I think, is that you have a cohesive narrative. 
you have a story within which you fit. This story incorporates your past, but also your future. You have a vision for the future. It incorporates other people, your loved ones, community, family, and, and so on and so forth. So it's a story, it's a narrative. It's very important to have a balance between fantasy and reality. It's not good to be 100% in reality because reality sucks. And if you're 100% in reality, you're not likely to survive long. And of course, it's not good to be 100% in fantasy. Narcissists are 100% in fantasy. That's of course not good. You must maintain a balance, but the two should exist. You definitely must have a fantasy life. And if you don't have a fantasy life, you cannot be you cannot be happy. People who are too much in, in reality, too much in reality, let's say very tough businessmen, or very tough politicians, or criminals, or they're too much in reality, they're usually unhappy. And people who professionally suppress their self, actors, for example, in movies or in theater, more, more in movies, when they suppress their self, they, their, their job is to not be themselves. These people have a much higher um, incidence of depression and anxiety and so on and so forth. So they are much, it's, they seem to be less happy than other people. Now we have many professions where you should suppress who you are. You should suppress yourself. For example, surgeons, medical doctors in hospitals and so on, they must suppress their empathy or they will not be able to function. In all these professions, without exception, the rate of depression is much higher than in other professions. Wherever you need to suppress, to deny part of yourself or who you are, that leads to very, very bad outcomes and a general unhappiness. So we, we have indications what would make people happy as far as uh, psychology, but they come from philosophy, not from the science, so-called science of psychology. Okay, so, so basically it isn't uh, detrimental to happiness, to uh, daydream, but what about nostalgia? Nostalgia is, uh, is pain. It's another name for pain. It's a highly specific type of pain, but there are many other specific types of pain. <laughs> it is pain that is felt because of a loss. And the loss is the past, or a specific past. And the past that includes a place and people in that place and interactions that took place with these people in that place. So it's a pain, it's a pain reaction. Um, it is not conducive to, to health and because it's not conducive to mental health, it's not conducive to happiness. And it is part of a much larger phenomenon known as grief syndrome or prolonged grief disorder, prolonged grief syndrome. It's when you grieve, you mourn for something you have lost and you cannot stop it. You continue to, you lost someone or you lost something or and you, you, you mourn it, you grieve and you cannot stop. You cannot stop for one year, for two years, for 10 years, for 20 years. For, you just cannot stop. This is unhealthy, of course. Any fixation on the past and any fixation of, on the future uh, are unhealthy and will never lead to happiness. If you are too too focused on your past, you bl you blame your parents for something, or you analyze mistakes that you made, or you miss some location, some place, nostalgia, or these are all fixations on the past. Or if you're fixated on the future, you're constantly fantasizing and daydreaming, and but you never do anything in present. So these two types of fixation are not healthy. The only healthy thing, the only possibility of happiness is to be in the present. And this is what we teach in mindfulness and so on. But to be in the present and to be in the present within your body and within your mind, to be fully aware and integrated with your body and with your mind in the present. It doesn't mean you have to be an idiot. Of course, you can learn a lot from the past. And of course, you should plan for the future. But your emotional investment should be only in the present, never in the past and never in the future. You should not be emotionally invested in what is no more, 
and you should not be emotionally invested in what is not here yet. Because these are fantasies. This is not reality. The past is not reality. The future is not reality. Not anymore. So this is a choice of fantasy over reality. And that's what I said earlier. If the balance, if there is imbalance between reality and fantasy, it's bad. Nostalgia, therefore, is bad. It's a form of prolonged grief of loss, which is past fixated and sacrifices the present. And that's bad. And that's a, that's a condition for unhappiness. Okay, so uh, uh, practically it's the same, the same thing. Uh, if uh, nostalgia is um, about uh, an enjoyable moment from the from your past, so it doesn't that matter that? if you are looking to <coughs> okay to a sad moment or to a happy one. It is the same. Any fixation on the past is a fantasy because the past is no more; it's gone. So it's a fantasy. So it's a decision to sacrifice reality in favor of fantasy. There's a pain of uh, pain of loss, but you're stuck in the past, and that's not healthy, and will never make you happy. Never make you okay. happy. Grief should be limited. Grief is saying goodbye. When we say goodbye at the end of this session, you're not going to tell me goodbye for one year. You're going to tell me goodbye for two seconds, no? And we say goodbye. But if you insisted to tell me goodbye for one year, I would know that something is very wrong with you. And maybe you're a very unhappy person. <laughs> yeah. Grief is saying goodbye. You lost a loved one. You lost a loved one. You say goodbye. But it, you must say goodbye. And move on. And finish the Zoom meeting. You must click exit this session. That's it. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting because... Uh... I have a friend that's looking back to the past and I found uh, I find myself uh, pretty much looking into the future and not acting in the present. <laughs> and that's why that's one of the the key things that I want to to address in uh, in the, the future <laughs> starting from today. <laughs> that must mean that something in the in the in the present frightens you or you feel bad about or you're unhappy with something in the present is threatening something in the present is you want to avoid and this is where you should focus but definitely you cannot be happy under these conditions without present orientation mindfulness you cannot be happy. you uh, you talked earlier about um, being authentic and i was uh, somehow uh, asking myself when do you know that you are uh, closer to your to your authentic being to your i don't know maybe 90% of your exactly <laughs> being yourself not not just well, imagining uh, bigger bigger minds than mine uh, jean paul sartre and others have written about this of course kierkegaard all the big existentialists they dealt with the issue of authenticity especially sartre but I would, I would, um, I would give you a kind of instrument or tool how to find the authentic part. In your mind, there are voices. They talk to you all the time. You're not listening because there's a lot of outside noise, and the outside noise is drowning the inside noise. But if you were to isolate yourself and sit quietly and do nothing, the, you will begin to hear these voices. They talk to you all the time. You need to write them down. Write these voices down. One of them says, Andre, don't do this. One of them says, Andre, you should do this. You write all the voices down. If you can think of another person in your life who is saying the same thing, it's not your voice. So if there is a voice inside your head and it is saying something, and there is another person in your life, not generally, in your life, who is saying the same thing, that means it's not your voice. When you are left with the only voice where you can find no parallel, no other person in your life who, is saying, who, who said the same or is saying the same, that is you. That is the authentic you. You have the voices of your mother and your father and your teachers and your peers. and your, There are many voices. 
your mother tells you it's not good to not uh, brush your teeth. Your father tells you it's, you should uh, you should flirt with a girl this way, not that way, and so on. And all these voices are there. So when you don't brush your teeth, you feel very guilty. And there's a voice that tells you it's not okay not to brush your teeth. That's really, really bad behavior. And it's a reasonable voice and a voice worth listening to. But it's not your voice. It's not you. It's not who you are. When you write down all these voices, you will find to your amazement that you have hundreds of them and that only one of them is you. And that voice is the authentic self. And from that moment on, you should listen to that voice, only to that voice. I'm not saying not to learn from other voices, but to, to guide your life only according to this voice, not to let anyone else guide your life. When you have an external locus of control, when other people define your life, influence your life, determine your life, direct your life, guide your life, in such a situation, you can never be happy. This happiness involves total ownership of your life, total control over your life, total decision-making as to who you are and where you're going. And this cannot be accomplished if other voices have too much influence and too much input. You need to isolate you. And it's very difficult because you're drowning. Your small one voice is drowning in hundreds of other voices. And it's also very difficult because we lie to ourselves. Gradually, we begin to believe that these voices, that these voices are us. So these voices is me. It's not my mother. It's me. I I believe I should brush my teeth. You know, we internalize this process is called introjection. We introject these voices. They become us. So it's very difficult. But the tool I gave you is very simple. Just find another person who is saying the same thing, and it's not you. We have to hang up, wait five minutes, and click again. Exactly. Yeah. Seriously. Sure. I would like to. Okay. Uh, I don't think I can right now. I'm recording. If you want, I will send you the two files. Don't worry. Oh, okay. No, no problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, I would like to uh, to ask you if you can tell me a lot more on the idea of uh, uh, seeking, uh, not seeking, looking uh, over the unhappiness. Because I'm, I'm really, I'm really trying to find the best backbone for the documentary and this is uh, somehow uh, a very new approach but uh, if you believe me the first name for the documentary was unhappy so that's why it it comes back to uh, one of the my first ideas and that's why maybe I should go on this path mm -hmm. It's very common in uh, in philosophy, in science, in, that we have difficulty to define something, and the only to define the only way to define it is via its absence or via its negation. So, for example, what is health? What is to be healthy? It is the absence of a disease. Health is absence of disease. There's no other definition. Similarly, what is, I think, the best definition of happiness is the absence of unhappiness. So if we want to study something, it's much easier to study the negation of that something. As I told you, unhappiness or absence of happiness, lack of happiness, is universal. People are happy in different ways, but they are unhappy in the same ways. So it's it's applicable to everyone in all cultures and civilizations and societies and periods in history people have been unhappy exactly the same way that is why old ancient writings such as the bible resonate with us the human experience is the same the last ten thousand years people in the bible have been unhappy exactly the same way we are unhappy but happiness in the bible in the times of the bible 
was very different to happiness today. As I told you, today we, we equate happiness with consumption, consumption of goods, consumption of people. Uh, in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, happiness meant prosperity and contribution to the collective. For example, when the founding fathers of the United States wrote the United States Constitution, they wrote, every man has an inalienable right for the pursuit of happiness. And today we understand every man has a right to buy an iPhone. But that's not, that's not what they meant. They meant every man has the right to contribute to his society, to his community, to his collective. That's what they meant, actually. There was a definition of the word happiness at that time. So happiness changes too much from one individual to the next, from one society to the next, from one period of history to the next. It's meaningless to study it. But if you study unhappiness, you're on solid ground. Because unhappiness in Ghana, in India, in Romania, in Macedonia, in Russia, in Israel, in Turkey, is the same. The same. We are all unhappy the same way. And also, it would finally lead you to the goal of defining happiness. Because happiness would be an absence of these conditions. Once you specify all the conditions of unhappiness, then what is left is happiness. It's like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes said, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever is left, however improbable, must be the truth. If you eliminate all conditions of unhappiness, whatever is left must be happiness. And we do this in many, many fields. In many, many fields we do. For example, black holes, black holes in astrophysics. You cannot see a black hole because it absorbs the light. You cannot, you, there's nothing you can say about black holes. But what is happening around the black hole that defines the black hole. So the black hole is defined by its negation. As I said, health is defined as absence of illness and so on and so forth. I think it's much more realistic project to focus on unhappiness. And at the end, you will find that you have defined happiness also. Darkness and light, same with darkness and light. Yeah, same. What is darkness? Can you define darkness positively? No, darkness is the absence of light. There's no such thing as darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. Simple. Yeah, the, the, that's a, a, a very, very nice way of looking at it. And maybe that's why in the beginning I was looking at unhappiness because the, the, the first naming was... Um, Neferichire, which in Romanian is uh, unhappiness. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, it, it was also a, a, a little wordplay because we cut the a ne and it was like feri, fericire, happiness without the unhappiness. Is, but somehow it, the idea um, remains. Uh, and right now the naming is... Um, uh, let me translate it uh, around happiness. Some somehow that's that's the meaning because we are always in the presence of happiness from my point of view, but sometimes we 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 don't know. We we don't even bother yeah. to look, or we don't. If even you believe that happiness observe. comes, if you believe that happiness comes from outside which is capitalistic thinking. Happiness comes from outside. So you must consume the outside. You must eat. You must buy. You must have sex. You must consume the outside. You know? If you believe that happiness comes from outside, that means that whenever you cannot consume, you would be frustrated. You would feel like a failure. And that means if you, any minute that you don't consume, you would be unhappy. This definition of happiness is dependent upon outside stimuli and outside events and outside people and so on, guarantees that you will be most of the time unhappy. 
But of course, if happiness is a state of being, if it's an internal condition, if it has to do with how you manage your life, whether you respect yourself, whether you act with dignity, whether you contribute to your to your community, whether things that are dependent on you, if you are in control, if you're in charge, if you own your life, then you will be most of the time happy, not unhappy. Internal locus of control guarantees happiness. External locus of control guarantees unhappiness. When you depend on other people, dependency is one of the forms of unhappiness because it guarantees frustration and aggression also. So we need to shift the perception of happiness as hedonistic and having to do with consumption. By the way, the word consumption until the end of the 19th century uh, meant illness. When you had consumption, you died. So I'm not kidding. The word consumption in English until the 19th, end of the 19th century meant Ill, deadly illness. Similarly, in the 16th century, uh, the word silly, silly today means stupid, an idiot. I, if I tell you you're silly, you're being silly, you're, you're being stupid, yeah? But the word silly in the 16th century meant happy, fortunate person. So when, when I wanted to tell you in the 16th century, you look happy, I would tell you, you look silly. Because, and you begin to see how the language is giving you, giving you clues, giving you hints. The language is telling you consumption is sick. The language is telling you, if you think you can capture happiness, if you think you can understand happiness, you are silly. The language is telling you this. Happy, and happiness is fortunate. It depends on, 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 on fortune in, in when you're silly. When you're being silly, you think that happiness depends on, on, on the outside, on fortune. That's why you're silly. The language is directing you. There's all human wisdom is embedded in language. When we study etymology, we find everything. You don't need philosophy, you don't need psychology, you don't need anything. You study language. So the roots of words as they evolved and so on, the perception of happiness began to be external in the 14th, 15th, 16th, mainly 16th century. The perception of happiness is coming from outside. And at that point, the word was silly. And then later, it became dependent on consumption, which was the name of a deadly disease. And nothing else, by the way, just deadly disease. There was no consumption to buy things. <laughs> so wow. it's, it's indicative. It's, it's very important to study the language, what the language is saying. Wow. By the way, in psychology, yeah. psychology, for example, when you study psychology, you understand how divorced we are from wisdom of the ages. For example, in psychology, when I want to say that you are incapable of being happy, you have a mental problem, psychological problem, that you cannot be happy. I would say that you have anhedonia. Anhedonia. You are not capable of hedonism. I'm not exactly, kidding. Yeah. You are not capable of hedonism, so you cannot be happy. You are not capable of pleasure, so you cannot be happy. Anhedonia is treated as a pathology. Being incapable of hedonism is treated as a pathology. When I say, actually, that being incapable of hedonism is a condition for happiness, and, and I'm not the only one who is saying it. There's a huge tradition of wise people all over thousands of years that are saying this. Um, take another thing. In psychology, we don't say people. The word people or persons is not used. We say objects. So, for example, when we want to say relationships between people, we call it object relations. Whenever you read in psychology text and there, there is the word object, it means human being. It tells you a lot about the thinking yeah. of psychology because psychology started off essentially as a tool for social control. Psychology was started in Germany by Wundt. 
He established a laboratory and he studied the physiological reactions of people to variety of stimuli. It was intended to feed into advertising, consumption, and, and so that's how psychology started. Psychology was always hand in hand with capitalism, with control, with, of course, in USSR, psychology or psychiatry was used to suppress dissidents, yes? But in the West, it's not much different. If you are, you know, if you are too way out of line, they call you a narcissist or psychopath. What is a narcissist or psychopath? It's the intrusion of psychology into social control discourse. If you stigmatize me, if you demonize me, and you call me narcissist, you call me psychopath because I disagree with you, that means you are abusing psychology to damage me somehow. The psychology is an instrument of social control and a pseudoscience. It's not a science. But the very language of psychology is very indicative of the mindset. It's a capitalistic consumption mindset. Anhedonia, object relations. <laughs> well, I have a lot, to, a lot to think about and to read about right now because you started with me. <laughs> okay. So right now, um, I think I, I somehow covered all my questions and I okay. have a lot of new questions that I need to take care of and to plan ahead because I, I I need somehow to put them in order and That's maybe always a good they, idea. <laughs> yeah exactly and maybe uh, if you are kind enough when uh, we will be almost ready if you if you want we can uh, talk a little bit like 10 minutes or 15 minutes about it because somehow I need uh, I need a little bit of guidance and I think you you my, you can help me with, my with pleasure, that. My pleasure. I'm at your disposal. Don't worry about it. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so, so much for... We say goodbye for now and we will meet again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I will stay up. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. I remember. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Let me just find the record button. Here it is. <laughs>